which I'm very happy to do to introduce uh, Barbara's talk this evening. Um, so Barbara came to Bath in 2010. I should say I'm uh, in the professor in the Department of Life Sciences at the University of Bath. So Barbara joined the Department of Chemistry um, in Bath in 2010. Um, she's been an a, a, a unbelievable uh, colleague and friend since then. She's, she's really uh, um, set the place on fire, um, not literally. <laughs> she works in chemistry, but, <laughs> but scientifically. Um, you may have heard over the, uh, over the course of the COVID pandemic about the use of wastewater for monitoring the spread of COVID. And you might have thought, oh, that's a great idea. But let me tell you now, Barbara had this idea many years before. She's been working on wastewater-based uh, epidemiology Um, well, well, actually, she's she's been gracious enough to put me on her projects. <laughs> um, so it, without any further waffle from me, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome uh, Barbara Casper Gordon. Thank you very much. Really, really happy to be able to uh, speak today. I just need to find out. Okay, I'll try to do. Oh, if not, you will hear a lot about it today. And I will show a little bit of frustration uh, and mention we started working uh, uh, with WBE uh, many years ago and had a little bit of struggle in terms of attracting funding and suddenly COVID happened and Working. Is this one working? No. Ah, <laughs> okay. US version. So I need to just. Oh, okay. Now it's working. Perfect. Okay. So um, we are living in a um, world with growing population. Um, there will be more of us in the future. Luckily, the rate of population growth is slowing down, but there will be still more of us. And we tend to live in urban areas. There'll be more of us living in urban areas. And on top of it, we have globalization. And this is a perfect breeding ground for the spread of uh, pathogens. And we had a good example of this in, in, the, in, the, in the case of SARS-CoV-2 and most recent COVID pandemic. And I think you will all agree with me that we failed in terms of detection, management, and response to SARS-CoV-2. We've done all we could, but we should have done much, much more. And there were many reasons why we failed uh, globally. And one of those reasons is and was that we didn't have any early warning systems that could capture the virus quickly enough and um, trigger response system at the local, regional, national, and global uh, scales. And well, we had an idea, and I'd already uh, aligned to this, uh, on how we could do, um, how we could build early warning systems um, to, to track uh, the um, spread of uh, disease, infectious or not, via waste of the base immunology. I will tell you what WB is about, but just a very quick one. So this is on the one slide on my frustration. So before COVID, we wrote proposals and we put for example, City Health is one of the many successful proposals that we had. And we just put in lines like, we have a tool that can uh, help us to, to create early warning systems for outbreaks of disease. Um, many proposals were rejected. Some have gone through, so we managed to progress, but not at the scale we wanted to. Then COVID happened. 
And it was incredible to see how whole community, governments, academia, and industry got together and tried to solve things quickly. So suddenly we built the only warning system way too late. Uh, so there were issues with, with its application, with its uh, implementation uh, at the national and global level. We've done it. And it was incredible to, to, to see how everyone can work together to, to deliver. And I hope that we learned the lesson. And we applied for projects again. <laughs> Unfortunately, projects are still uh, getting rejected. Not all of them, not all of them. But there is one quote from one of the um, um, reviewer. Uh, he, she said, I don't know that the wastewater can be feasibly used to monitor a community's health over time. Have you not read all the papers? Have you not seen news? So that's how science works. That's how research works. That there is a little bit of luck in, in, involved in terms of what gets, does not get funded. But we are in a good place in a way that, that, that we, we did develop something that has a huge potential to help us with future pandemics. And we are continuing to, uh, with the development of, of the tool. So how does... Oh, I think I need to do something with this one. <laughs> I'll leave it like this. I hope it's not going to be too annoying. Can I actually? Can you? Where is the file? This one. Ah. Okay, good. We'll have this press. Oh, no, it's fine. Okay, so how does WB work? So every day, every hour, every second of our life, we are exposed to various different external agents. We call them, um, or the stresses, called xenobiotics. So foreign um, um, biological, chemical, or physical agents that affect our our bodies. So uh, the kind of natural response, especially in the context of um, chemical um, uh, biological uh, exposure, is to limit this exposure, limit the, the effects of, uh, of xenobiotic external um, agents. And it's done via various different ways. So for example, in terms of chemicals, we have um, metabolism. And the role of metabolism is to make chemicals less, uh, less um, non-polar, so more polar, more likely excreted with with urine. And um, so what we see in terms of the, the, the product of, of exposure is a various different groups of, of um, chemical uh, agents, biological agents. So we can see metabolites, we can see pathogenic organs, we have C, we can see changes at the protein levels as well as the genetic level. And um, they get excreted various routes. One of them is via urine and feces. And with urine and feces, um, this various different biomarkers end up in wastewater, in the sewage system. And then they're captured by wastewater treatment plants. And so what we do in terms of WBE is that we look at wastewater sample. So wastewater sample is a fingerprint of community's health and lifestyle. Because whatever we're exposed to, whatever we do, it ends up in, in, in wastewater. And um, um, this is, uh, we, we tend to sample um, um, wastewater at waste treatment plants, working very closely with, uh, with our um, best collaborator, Wessex Water here locally. Um, and we sample on regular basis, for example, on daily basis, we collect composite samples and uh, take them to our labs and analyze uh, with various tools, both for chemical um, um, entities as well as uh, for uh, biological entities, and when we need to do biology, we look in direction of ED. So ED is doing all the all the sequencing. Um, we work mainly with mass spectrometry uh, to deliver on the chemical profiles, and they all tell us a story about about exposure, about effects, uh, about the status of community's health. And I will give you some examples on what we can do. So what is special about wastewater-based epidemiology? It is comprehensive because everyone is contributing to wastewater. Everyone is, is excreting uh, all the different biomarkers uh, in, uh, on a daily basis. So we capture this. It is continuous in a way that we, we monitor, we can potentially monitor wastewater every, every day, forever, really. It's anonymous. We don't know who is contributing to, 
to wastewater, we capture um, wastewater from whole communities. And just give you an example, typical treatment works will be about 10,000 people or might even serve a few million people. So the biggest we ever worked with uh, treatment works for the city of, of London. Um, that we captured a um, population of um, about 3 million people. It's nearly real time. I don't say it's real time because we still have to take samples to our labs, but we are working towards with, with, with new sensing um, approaches to, to capture information real time. And you can imagine that real time uh, waste based biology is the way forward in terms of trying to identify, for example, new pathogens coming into play. So um, predicting uh, infections um, before, uh, before they spread to the community level. It's objective and unbiased in a way because we capture whole communities. So um, we get the most comprehensive information possible. The biggest issue with WB is that we don't know who is ill if someone is ill in the community. So it works more as a early warning system. So I always say it's not a tool that's going to replace other epidemiology tools. It's one tool in a larger toolkit. So we always will be working with clinicians uh, doing individual testing, we're going to work with those focusing on biomonitoring of, of, of individuals. Um, WB is a tool to help with early warning, so understanding what's happening at the community level, um, and if something is happening, we then can trigger uh, other processes to, to, to capture um, the issue before it spreads um, uh, more um, uh, widely. Again. Ah, okay. So yes, wastewater-based biology focuses on people. So we capture sample of wastewater produced by a community, and I'm emphasizing it now because I'll move to one health approach later on when we look at the wider environment. But for now, it's the community. This um, slide summarizes it all. Urine samples from thousands of people would have to be tested to verify community-wide health status. This is expensive and logistically impractical, but when one wastewater sample is needed to assess community's health with high certainty and low cost and in real time. Again, in real, near real time, because we are not there yet in terms of real time monitoring. So wastewater is a diagnostic medium for community wide health, community -wide health state, status assessment. And just a little bit of uh, where we started, um, mentioned earlier on, we, it, it was um, more than 10 years ago when we when we started working together at the European level with like-minded people, we created a score group uh, in 2010. And we were lucky to start working with European Center for Monitoring Center of Drugs and Drug Addition. This is now called EU Drug Agency. And so we, our early steps were in trying to understand usage of drugs, illicit drugs, um, at the community level in various um, e European cities, just to build this early warning system for changes um, uh, within within uh, within the Europe. And the first project that we had funded is EU IT and Supra project. And I still remember when I when I had it reviewed by our pre award team uh, at the University of Bath, and they said, Barbara, this sounds dodgy. Can't you do something more mainstream? And I said, No, this is what I really want to do. And we had an amazing net network in, in Europe. And, and luckily, uh, I did not listen to this person. Um, we continue to working together and we were heavily funded by Europe by, by this time. We, our score group is, is still working well and delivering some of the internal assessments um, um, for, for the rest of Europe, which, which is amazing. In the UK, we, we got funded mainly to do international work. So work uh, closely with um, our colleagues in South Africa and in, in Nigeria. And then other projects followed, but this was really long path in terms of COVID is here. So we started with these drugs, alcohol uh, abuse, and I will give you some examples, then moved into food toxicants, infectious disease, non-communicable diseases, and COVID is here. So SARS-CoV-2 triggered it all in terms of it is really mainstream in terms of how uh, we are approaching um, epidemiology. So this is, as I said, one additional um, tool in the epidemiology toolkit. So how does it work? I'll just click it all. So, because cocaine was our first target, I will I will say a few words about about how 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 WB works. So, uh, when one takes cocaine, uh, it gets metabolized and excreted. And what we tend to focus on in WB not on the parent compound because it can be um, 
can be released into, into wastewater directly, we focus on metabolites. And coca is an interesting one because depending on route, route of administration and co-administration, it produces different metabolites. So we capture all these different metabolites so we know uh, whether how cocaine was, was consumed as, as well as administered, as well as whether it was administered with other, uh, with other chemicals such as uh, alcohol. So we focus on the metabolites. So indigenously formed entities in our bodies, not the parent compound, to be able to understand exposure. And we calculate per capita in, intake. So what else do we need to be able to do this? It's actually you know rather complex process. We need to have an understanding of metabolism. Uh, of the chemical in question. We need to have an understanding how many people contribute to, to wastewater sample. We need to know the flow of wastewater because flow is the biggest variable. Uh, we calculate at the end is the per capita daily intake and we need to understand the biomarker stability. We don't want to work with biomarkers so uh, the chemicals of interest to us that are unstable in wastewater. They need to be stable to be able to give us this per capita intake. And these are kind of typical examples of the work that we end up uh, with. So this is um, this is one of the illicit drugs consumption across Europe. So this is EMCDA's um, website. If you are interested, there is lots of information on this. But this is work produced by our score group, so a European network. But of course, we do more than only uh, trying to understand um, what is being um, taken and, and where, we can use WB to understand whether there was an impact of an intervention. In this case, we have policy impact. We, we tested whether change in regulation for uh, certain chemicals will trigger change in the behavior of community tested. So here we have um, four illicit drugs, amphetamine, methamphetamine, MDMA, and cocaine, and mephedrone. I'm not sure whether you've heard about mephedrone. It was a big deal a few years ago. So mephedrone was a legal high. So legal highs are usually the chemicals that are very similar in, in nature to uh, illicit drugs. And we have here an example of amphetamine, methamphetamine. Uh, but they are, because the structure is a little bit different to the illicit drugs, they can be purchased. Um, they can be called... Um, um, bathing salts, they can be purchased as not for human consumption. So uh, mephedrone was used in our region uh, a lot. And you can see uh, in 2014 14 and 15, this is city of Bristol, we had lots of mephedrone. Mephedrone, uh, legal highs in, in general are problematic because there is very little known about the metabolism and interaction with human body. So there might be issues after administration. Many people, young people died because of administration of methadone. That's why regulation was introduced to ban it. So with the new, new psychoactive substances bill, uh, you can see there was the methadone disappeared from the market in 2016. So in many ways, when you look at it, the regulation worked. But look what happened with cocaine. It went up. So regulation worked partially in a way that he removed methadone from the market, but people that wanted to abuse drugs moved to something else. Okay, so WB gives us this opportunity to test whether interventions that can be societal, policy, or technological actually work. And normally it's actually very difficult to, to capture this. And sky is the limit in terms of what we can test for. Uh, so in, in our group, uh, Environmental Chemistry Public Health Research Group at the University of Bath, as well as in wider networks, we, we try to um, find those kind of key, important, interesting, uh, critical biomarkers that can tell us about community health. So we focused a lot on exposure to environmental food stresses, um, and I'll give you some examples uh, on this, and we also looked at community-wide disease status, mainly focusing on various different pharmaceuticals that can be used as proxies for, for example, the level of diabetes uh, uh, or cardiovascular diseases at the community level. And in our group, we actually spend most of our time trying to uh, identify these biomarkers. Um, and uh, most of it is done by utilization of mass spectrometry tools. And you can imagine uh, that wastewater is a rather complex matrix. And our biomarkers are usually tiny little quantity in this very complex matrix. We always talk about a needle in a haystack. So analytics is critical here. And so our strength in our research group at the University of Bath 
is the ability to extract information about trace concentrations of those entities, chemical entities or biological entities in a very, very complex wastewater matrix. So I mentioned earlier on the WB is, is, is focusing on people, but of course, we are part of the wider environment. So now we are kind of moving away from focusing on wastewater only and looking at the whole river catchment. So if you can imagine people living in this catchment and are excreting um, um, all the biomarkers into wastewater, obviously wastewater is untreated and, uh, and treated wastewater end up, ends up in, in our river. So we have here, the River Avon, and the River Avon is, is also a very nice fingerprint on, in terms of societal um, health lifestyle. Um, so what we want to do now is capture it all. So not necessarily only focusing on wastewater, moving beyond wastewater and incorporating this in, this, in the One Health concept. So One Health is a cross-sectoral, multidisciplinary effort aimed at holistic understanding and management of public environmental health. And wastewater, or may, maybe now we should be using it, uh, calling it water-based immunology. It's a great enabler of One Health. Why? We can evaluate public and environmental health status. I just want to emphasize again, we are part of the environment. So we need to, to understand our health. We also need to make sure that we look after environmental health too. We can inform One Health action and actually evaluate uh, the mitigation strategies that are linked with One Health actions. So a little bit about uh, our own Avon catchment. Um, so Bath is somewhere here. So we have here um, Bristol and um, uh, Chippenham and Trowbridge. Um, I will then say a few words about that, about, a few words about that in our national study. But to start with, I will I will I will give you some examples uh, of the work that we've done here over years, working very closely with with the West Exports I mentioned already. Um, a, we produced a lot of very good work together. Um, so we are focusing on, and the Avon catchment know it very well, um, and what we try to do here, we captured wastewater from five wastewater treatment plants in this catchment um, to be able to understand community's health and lifestyle, and these five treatment works served over 75% of the overall population in the catchment. So we have pretty good understanding of about the community living in this catchment by sampling five sites only. And if you think about if we are dealing with SARS-CoV-2 or any other pathogen, uh, how many people would need to be tested to, to see uh, whether there is infection in the community? Here we collect five wastewater samples a day to be able to provide the same type of information. Again, I want to emphasize we don't know who is ill, but we know whether it, there is uh, uh, infection happening in the community. So five treatment works. They have different, they serve different populations in terms of the size from uh, um, 18,000 people to um, uh, uh, almost 900,000 people in the city of Bristol. Um, I mentioned earlier on, we focus on, on various different chemicals, and I'm, I'm, my, my intention is not for you to, to read them all, it's just to give you the, the flavor of what we are looking at. So we focus on pharmaceuticals, illicit drugs, um, chemicals coming from our households, uh, industrial chemicals, uh, agricultural chemicals. We also capture um, uh, pathogens, but mainly working with, 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 for example, Ed's group. Um, and we have um, mass um, spectra uh, bank in, in our um, group. We can mine retrospectively uh, whenever we need to, uh, if we want to understand uh, anything about new biomarkers that come into play. So a lot of work in terms of data mining in our group. And this is a typical um, example of the work that we come up with, um, more kind of qualitative in nature. We have pie charts here. So uh, this pie, pie chart is, uh, is linked with wastewater influence, so raw wastewater coming from our communities. And this is average from the whole uh, five treatment works here, so over one million people. And if we mine information in wastewater from uh, um, um, in the context of public health, we are looking at various different markers here. So we have uh, lifestyle chemicals, we have some uh, anti-inflammatories, we have uh, anti-diabetics, various different chemicals that we find here. And they inform us about public health status and, and lifestyle. Now, if we move into the catchment, the so river catchment, we are focusing on the environmental health. You can see that the profile here is different. Uh, and the reason why we see different things here is because we have waste with the treatment 
uh, in between the two. So this is wastewater influence, this is the receiving environment. So river water that has already had an input from wastewater treatment plant uh, treated wastewater. And yes, um, we treatment processes in, 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 in this catchment actually very, uh, very good. We tend to see the removal of, of um, most of the chemicals that they might be potentially problematic when it comes down to environmental health. So you can see in this particular case, we, have, we had 169 kilograms per day of uh, 141 chemicals of emerging concern entering treatment works, and most of them have been removed. Um, about four, 14 kilograms uh, have been discharged into the surface waters. Now, the question is, does it matter? It's a very small percentage. It doesn't matter for most uh, chemicals, but for some, it will. And one of the compounds that we are looking at are antibiotics. I'm sure you have heard about antibiotic resistance. Um, it's, it's, it's a big issue. Uh, and we see environment as one of the hotspots for resistance. So we need to have an understanding with antibiotics uh, somehow manage to find a way into the environment. And here we have um, um, River Avon from City A, which is Chippenham, down to uh, the Bristol. Um, and you see these are daily loads of various different chemicals. So we have antidiabetics, lifestyle, pharmaceuticals, industrial chemicals, pesticides, illicit drugs. You see, when we go with the flow of the river, we see an increase in daily loads. It was really interesting to see that no matter where we are, we contribute to the river catchment the same quantity. So each of us on daily basis will be contributing about 154 milligrams um, of those kind of 141 chemicals uh, into the catchment. Okay, it's interesting to see. You can see the, the, the arrow here is very low. So it's 154 plus minus 12 milligrams. And we see this in the river catchment. So with the flow, the more people live down here, we see higher uh, daily loads of, of chemicals. And um, it was interesting to see that, that no matter where we are, whether we live in Chippenham in Bristol, we are responsible for environmental contamination. And it's a very interesting piece of information because if we know who is the stressor in the catchment, we know what kind of interventions we might introduce. So if we are, people living in the catchment, contributing to environmental um, um, degradation, um, we might be thinking about interventions that focus on our lifestyle, for example. Um, and there are some um, interesting um, ideas that we had working, for example, with our social scientist, Julie Barnett, um, in terms of how we can um, uh, change the way we use certain chemicals, especially pharmaceuticals. So give you an example of antibiotics. Um, so we have the same five cities. So city A, Chippenham, city C is Bath and E, Bristol. This is Kensham and Trowbridge. And we looked uh, at um, antibiotics. So um, what kind of daily loads of antibiotics we have in our catchments? And you see city E, huge quantity of antibiotics, so some milligrams per day. Um, but you see that this nicely aligns with uh, the, the number of people contributing to uh, wastewater in this particular city. So city E, the largest population, has the highest daily load contribution. This is in, in wastewater. Next city in the catchment is city C, hundreds of 100,000 people, and then we have city B, D, um, A, and D. Well, what was interesting to see that this followed in terms of resistance genes present in the catchment. So city E, the highest pharmaceutical load, Antibiotic load is linked also with the highest um, daily load in terms of gene copy per day of uh, corresponding resistance genes, and CTC is the second one. So what we then did, we normalized daily loads at population sites. So we calculated per capita um, uh, intake of antibiotics and then resulting resistance genes. You can see these things plateau, and they plateau because we have population is the driver for both antibiotic usage as well as resistance genes in this catchment. But what else we've seen here? City A and B are in Wiltshire. City C, D and E are in Somerset. I hope I'm right. And you can see this differ. They cluster together. Does this mean that prescribing of antibiotics differ in Somerset versus Wiltshire? Maybe it does. And if this is true, we then know 
what to do. We need to work locally with our GPs to maybe change prescribing practice. So we're trying to, as one of the projects, like Mono One projects, is, is focusing on doing exactly that. So again, WB provides us with evidence, information that can allow us to trigger intervention strategies. And they don't have to be technological in nature, as we always think. They can be societal um, and um, um, also policy uh, driven. One of the things that we tend to do, and we don't even think about, um, maybe you should actually think about now, what do you do with medicines you don't need anymore? Do you take them back to the pharmacy? Great, brilliant. Not many people actually do this because we see this in wastewater. So there's one example here. So with our tool, we can see when direct dumping down the drain of pharmaceuticals happens. Um, and we do it by looking at a ratio of parent compound to metabolite. If you have too much of parent compound versus metabolite, we know that someone dumped pharmaceuticals down the drain. And we have here an example of calomazepine. So calomazepine is an antiplatelet drug, and it should be used, the, 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 the usage per day should be the same because this is long uh, chronic disease. So people will be taking so in the community the same quantity every day. And you see this big spike here on Sunday. And this does not correspond with metabolite of calamazepine. This is calamazepine 10 11 epoxide. It was still nicely stable. So the community consumed the same quantity of calamazepine as ever. But we have this big spike. This is when someone dumped down the drain 253 pills um, in one particular location. So we have evidence for this that this is happening. So if we know that community is doing it and it shouldn't, we can then introduce some interventions, so educational campaigns. And again, this is something that we are uh, looking into working locally with, with Wessex Water, with Baines. Uh, there were a few uh, projects funded actually by, by Wessex Water doing exactly that. So instead of introducing new technological solutions to, to remove pharmaceuticals from wastewater effluent, how about we work with communities and maybe educate them a little bit in terms of why it's important to not to um, not to um, a, a remove pharmaceuticals in this particular uh, via this particular route, but take them back to to the pharmacy. What else can we see uh, in in wastewater? We tend to see pharmaceuticals that don't. I'm sorry, this is very busy and actually not very clear. But I will tell you what what we see here. So we have various different antibiotics here, and. When you see this kind of blue color, this is prescription of antibiotics. And the dots, these are our measurements. So blue dot indicates the parent compound and the orange dot, met dot metabolite. So if we see the patterns aligning between this blue here and our dots, that means that, that there is a good compliance in terms of antibiotic usage in the community versus prescription. So we have prescription coming from NHS, so this is primary care prescription mainly. But what we, so we see this um, across various different antibiotics, not necessarily complying as, as, as much as we would like to see. But what we also see, we see additional antibiotics that are not officially prescribed in the catchment. For example, we have antibiotics that are linked with TB, uh, with tuberculosis. And the question is, why are they in our catchment if they're not officially prescribed? They might be coming from somewhere else. So I'm not sure if you know, but if you, if if one suffers from TB, we'll have six months worth prescription. So might be traveling across different regions and countries even um, with this prescription without need, the need to buy one locally. So waste or based immunology gives us an understanding of um, when we look at various different pharmaceuticals as proxies, what people suffer from in the country in in the catchment. Okay, so officially. Uh, this pharmaceuticals are not prescribed uh, here, but we see them in wastewater. That means they must be used, so the people must be must be also uh, ill. And yes, chemicals can be used as proxies for various different uh, uh, diseases as well as exposure. And now this is another busy slide. I'm very good at producing busy slides. So we have five cities again, the same ones: A, B, C, D, and E. City C is, is Bath here, and we have various different chemicals here. So antidiabetics, antidepressants, cardiovasculars, illicit drugs, personal care products, industrial chemicals. And we have seven days worth um, population normalized daily load. So if you see for antidiabetics, it doesn't matter whether it's Sunday or Monday, we will be taking similar quantities of these pharmaceuticals. 
because it's a chronic disease. The situation is different with illicit drugs. We always see this spike during weekends. And it's really unpredictable when it comes down to industrial chemicals. So it really depends, but very often it's the, we the weekdays when we have higher um, quantities of certain industrial chemicals. But what is interesting when you look at uh, these various different graphs? What can, we, what can we see here? So the city C seems to have less of antidiabetics than other cities. It might be that it is um, the city with the, high, the lowest uh, deprivation index. As a result, it might uh, have lower uh, consumption of antidiabetics. City E is the youngest city. So maybe, as a result, it has the lowest usage of cardiovascular pharmaceuticals, but also the highest usage of illicit drugs. City um, B and E have high industrial presence. So exposure of communities in these two cities, so this is Trowbridge and Bristol, will be higher than if we live in City C. So you can see, looking at chemical profiles, we can... Um, see what community is exposed to, and also have a better understanding of, of um, what uh, communities suffer from in terms of uh, pharmaceuticals they use, because we can use pharmaceuticals as proxy for disease. Now, I'm sure you have heard about bisphenol A. Um, bisphenol A is, is, for example, banned in, uh, in children's uh, toys and, and, and babies, baby bottles. Um, it's because it's an endocrine disruptor. Um, and uh, actually, European Food Safety Authority said a tolerable daily intake is four micrograms per kilogram per day. And in general, we as a community um, are exposed to bisphenol A via food. And it is being said that our exposure via food is below this threshold level. So it's all great. Okay, it's all good. We wanted to see whether this is really the case. So the issue with, with looking at exposure to chemicals such as bisphenol A is, is to find characteristic metabolites that might be linked with exposure, but we are not focusing on the parent compound because it would give us, there's lots of bisphenol A uh, everywhere, really. So we will be able to link this with exposure. So we developed tools in our, in our group to be able to uh, identify biomarkers of exposure. In this case, is bisphenol A sulfate. I'm not going to get into details on how it's done. It's a kind of busy slide, but we have the stepwise process focused on uh, um, um, in vitro studies in terms of um, the metabolism as well as um, data mining with high resolution mass spectrometry. But these are the results that we get for the catchment. So we have again our five cities. A, B, C, D, and E. And if you remember, city B and E have industrial presence. Okay. So what can we see here? This is a bisphenol A sulfate, and this is milligrams per day per thousand people. So when we look at five different cities, we see that exposure to bisphenol A is lower during, during weekend. We have higher quantities during weekdays. Also, we have low exposure in cities A, C, and D. Bath is here, again. These are mainly cities that, that, uh, that don't have industrial presence. While city B, so Trowbridge, and city E, Bristol, have much higher exposure. And the question is where this exposure comes from. It is likely occupational exposure. Because uh, in these cities, we have, for example, pain formulation, we have food industry, so food packaging uh, that are... Um, uh, potentially contributing to, to, to one's exposure. So this is again bisphenol A in one part, this is in city Bristol. And you see that there's this kind of drop in uh, bisphenol A intake during weekends. And I always say, maybe, and I don't know why, it's just, it's just my um, uh, wishful thinking. Maybe during weekends, we tend to um, have a little bit better lifestyle. We cook our own meals. We maybe don't microwave um, um, food. As a result, we expose ourselves to bisphenol a little bit less. So if you do microwave food, and if you keep plastic packaging on, please don't do it ever again, because this is when you expose yourself to bisphenol A. Okay, so put the plastic has to go off before you put your foot into microwave. Um, we see that during weekend, we have high exposure to pyrethroid pesticides. And I 
thought initially that it might be because we eat more vegetables, so expose ourselves to pesticides via vegetables. But someone actually told me maybe it's because we do a little bit more gardening during weekends. So here it is. Again, WB can tell us about what we expose. And we have evidence for this now. And we can, if we have evidence, we can act upon it. Now, coming back to COVID, it took me a while, yeah? And I have to finish soon. I, I told uh, that I like talking, and you need to stop me at one point. Um, so I said uh, we did monitor uh, wastewater for SARS-CoV-2 uh, locally, working again with, uh, with Wessex water. It was actually amazing collaboration. We had samples delivered. Uh, John, somewhere here? Yeah, it was twice a week throughout the pandemics. So we were allowed to be in labs. It was actually very difficult to get permission to get back to our labs, but we really had the need to do something and we, and we uh, worked together with Wessex Water um, to, to, to uh, process the, the samples. So what can we see here? So um, this, is, um, total, this is total estimated SARS-CoV-2 uh, in gene copies per uh, 24 hours, and this is the the black line here, this is our wastewater measurement. Here we have COVID cases. The red one is COVID cases in the region. You can see how wastewater aligns well with the, uh, with the statistics that were given by NHS. And the cost of the measurement of, of wastewater is, is nothing in comparison with the testing, PCR testing. But what else can wastewater do? You see there's kind of two columns here. I don't know if you remember in October 21, I think we all want to forget this time, but if you remember, in this region, one of the labs that did PCR testing failed. And people were told that they were negative, they were actually positive, and they were wandering around and infecting people. We could see it in our wastewater measurements. So the PCR data tell us that there is drop in, uh, in uh, cases, but actually there was an increase in cases. Okay, so it's yet another tool that really helps us with understanding how community, um, uh, well, what community is exposed to. And there is much more that we that we looked at, and we have um, um, one example of of work that we are still working on. And I think Nicola is somewhere here. Yes, this is Nicola. Nicola's data set is crunching the data. As you can see, a few years later, and we are still working with the data. Here is looking at. Um, how we, um, it's about a, a pain management during a SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. So this are the kind of the gray columns here indicate COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 cases in the community. So you can see they were going up. And this is uh, of a period of two years. And these are pharmaceuticals that we took. So you can see paracetamol really went up when we were, uh, when there were higher number of cases. And the same was with ibuprofen. Yeah. You see how it's going up here. We didn't see any changes when it comes down to cardiovascular pharmaceuticals, benzafibrate, atenolol. And we shouldn't see any changes because these are long-term uh, chronic conditions and people were taking them, they had access, they were taking them as, as needed. But why does this matter? Nicola is crunching data, trying to understand what this really means. But one of the uh, interesting things is if we see, if we can only focus on paracetamol in the community and its usage in the community, if it goes up, that means that something is happening in the community. Okay, so it's a proxy indicator of, of, of um, a community dealing with, with an issue, such as, for example, a new pathogen. So I, I know that I don't have a lot of time left, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about our national study. So we worked very closely with Wessex Water. Uh, in the region, but also we worked nationally with UK Health Security Agency. And uh, we did similar work across the country, focusing on, on, uh, on uh, various uh, cities. We did focus on chemicals as well as viral targets. And we teamed up in, in this case with the Davy Johnson's group e based at Bangor University. And there's some really interesting things. Again, we are working with the data set still. But we have some initial ideas in terms of what, what we potentially can use uh, wasteful based neurology for in the future. So this is just to show you there's lots of data. I'm not going to get into details here because there's too much. I'm going to break it down in a second. Um, so here we have uh, um, chemical markers and here we have uh, viral markers that we looked at 
uh, in various cities across the country. So some pharmaceuticals are pretty uh, constant, the same uh, across communities, and these are um, some of the cardiovascular they mentioned. They were not as interesting to us. They're good population markers, but they don't tell us a lot about communities. Pharmaceuticals that are interesting to look at are, for example, paracetamol. They were going up and down depending on you know, how the level of infection, for example, with SARS-CoV-2 in various different communities. So at the moment, we have high uh, levels this is Lancaster here, we have London here, uh, as well as fexofenadine is, uh, is a pharmaceutical used um, in, uh, for example, um, asthma uh, allergic reactions. So fexofenadine, you can see it, go, it goes up and down depending on where, where we are and which city we are focusing on. But it can give us really good understanding uh, of proxy. It's a proxy, for example, for air quality. But viral markers are really, really interesting. So here we have SARS-CoV-2, and you can see it was pretty constant across communities. There was a little bit more of it in London. Uh, it's because at the time when we were sampling, there was really high uh, prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 everywhere. So we couldn't really differentiate uh, too much. It was basically endemic in, this, in, 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 in the UK um, across the cities that we looked at. But it was really interesting to see other uh, targets. So um, we have here norovirus, and we have also enterovirus here. So you can see, depending on the location, and this is Lancaster again, um, there was some outbreak in Lancaster, and there was a very low level. I don't know what London actually was low here. So um, viral markers, really interesting to look at in wastewater because of the um, intermittent presence. So they will be going up and down depending on the level of infection in the community. And actually, when thinking about norovirus, hospitals have real interest in, in applying this tool because norovirus at hospital means bad news. So if there is a tool that can give hospital a little bit of warning, norovirus is um, spreading in the community, there might be better preparedness for dealing with norovirus when it, when it reaches hospitals. So this is one of the um, applications of WB that might find um, a, a, might be taken forward at the hospital level. And and this is just a slide showing uh, some of the industrial chemicals. So you can see there is really no correlation between population size and and um, and the level of, of markers when it comes down to industrial chemicals. This is bisphenol A again. So some cities like City of Hull, really high levels of bisphenol A. And I actually don't know, we have not tested it as yet, but there might be some, some uh, presence of industry that exposes people to, to higher levels of this chemical uh, than, than everywhere uh, else uh, tested. And yeah, when we pull all the data together, we can see so, so much on, oh, and this is, I think, one of my second last slide. Um, and it's something that we are working on at the moment. We see some really interesting correlations. Some, for example, norovirus tends to correlate with antibiotics. SARS-CoV-2 correlated with antibiotics. Now, if SARS-CoV-2 correlates with antibiotics, it is actually okay to, to, to see this and explain, because obviously there are complications from SARS-CoV-2, so antibiotics are prescribed then. But if we see correlation of antibiotics with norovirus, this is no good news, because antibiotics don't help with treatment of norovirus. This means antibiotics are used unnecessarily to treat something that they cannot really um, help with. We see correlations, for example, between um, nicotine and some uh, cardiovascular pain, antihistamines, antidiabetic drugs. And actually, we know that metformin um, needs to be given at higher uh, daily doses uh, to patients that smoke, okay? And we see this in the community. So, uh, well, it's reassuring for us to see that metabolites correlate with parent compounds. So that means that we are doing a good job here. But this is just a snapshot from what is here, and this is yet to be unraveled. So maybe a uh, material for another talk in the next five years time or so. So just to summarize, um, WBE, can give us a good understanding of um, our lifestyle choices, pathogen prevalence, the health status of community, as well as exposure to harmful chemicals. But what is really interesting in terms of taking it forward is that it can be used as an evidence tool to introduce interventions, 
and then to evaluate their effectiveness. And this is something that we are working on, again, working closely with our local partners. We are planning to build a living lab in the city of Bath um, uh, with the aim of doing longitudinal work. So um, trying to understand building baselines in terms of uh, community, its health, and whether we can introduce interventions and monitor the effectiveness of the interventions. So this is the work for the future. So we had some uh, funding um, uh, recently uh, to be able to do this in the next five years. So watch this space. Um, where we will surely be providing uh, more evidence um, for, for lifestyle uh, disease uh, and exposure in years to come. And the final one is big thank you to um, our amazing environmental chemistry um, and public health research group. Some of us are present here today. Um, amazing team working. And I, I want to emphasize the hard work that, that people have done throughout pandemics. And there was no rest. Um, uh, we were in, in, in our labs uh, every day. And uh, even now, we just finished our uh, weekly monitoring um, uh, campaign in, uh, in Camenuelo. Uh, despite floods, despite cold, wind, and flat tires, uh, we managed to, to complete. And uh, I think that we, 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 I don't, didn't have to get up at 4 a.m. I think some of us had to get up at 4 a.m. to go and collect samples. And when is it that we, you, you, you went home every day? It was really late, am I right? 10, 11, so long time. And this is what it means to, to work in our group, but we can then get amazing data. Uh, um, that hopefully will, will serve um, some decision-making process in the future. So I will leave it there because I will never stop, Ed. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. That's uh, really, really great. I hope you hear all your amazing work over the years. Um, so and yours. <laughs> <laughs> She's just being nice. <laughs> um, let's take some questions uh, from the floor. If anyone's got any questions? Uh, from, at the moment, is it all quite a manual process to kind of start in the way for the safety aspect? What are the opportunities for kind of forcing that pipeline? Are, are there some special units coming online and things like that? Yes, we need to move into 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 uh, sensing. Yes, and I think actually the biggest issue during pandemics, when we did all this study nationally, was to ship samples from point A to B, and they have to be frozen. We had to send them on dry ice. So we had environment agency vans going up and down country to 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 send samples uh, to write labs. So yes, the biggest innovation needs to happen is in terms of sensing. Um, and well, we are working on it. We have some amazing uh, researchers at our university trying to, to develop new sensors. We are not there yet, but definitely it's one of the biggest things that we need to, we need to deliver on. Yeah, two questions, if you may. A really interesting topic, sort of fascinating. One quite technical question. I don't know whether you normalize for dry weather flows, but it's obviously in times of um, sort of uh, high rainfall, there's going to be a lot of ingress of stormwater, which will try and loose some of the boundaries um, sort of in Bolton there. Um, the other one was sort of more sort of policy orientated. I just wondered what sort of appetite there's been from UK sort of health security agency for sort of rolling this out wider and using it as a sort of warning system nationally. Thank you. Good question. So. Flow is our biggest issue, so a changing flow, and especially in the UK, it rains, it doesn't rain, it rains most of the time, but uh, it, we need to account for changes in, in flows, and we do so, so we have flow measurement alongside sample collection, so we have 20 hour composites, flow is also measured, again, Wessex Water providing us with flow measurements, and we normalize the flows, so no matter dry, wet weather, we, we normalize the flows. Um, when it comes down to... to um, policy making and, and taking the, 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 the data out uh, for the decision making process. Yes, UKHSA is, is, is very interested in taking this forward and they were driving uh, um, all the activities, um, no funding activities, uh, SARS-CoV-2 measurements in uh, during uh, COVID pandemics. I'm not sure whether you've heard about them utilizing this to capture polio in London and this 
the, the, the fact that, that polio was found in wastewater triggered interventions uh, locally uh, within the community in, in London. So UKHS is really ha heavily interested. Um, for example, in the context of AMR, there is there are national programs ongoing. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll be able to do uh, more and they are involved in our local activities too. So uh, fingers crossed, um, we, we will be able to progress it. The biggest issue still is the cost of samples. They have to be taken from one place to the other. We need to simplify it. So we need to have some kind of online measurements in place so it becomes even, even cheaper. So innovation, technological innovation needs to, needs to be in place so, so it is, it is um, yeah, easier to implement nationally. Oh yeah, this is yeah, yet another chemical, of, uh, a bunch of chemicals that we might be looking at. Yeah, so they're there. We, whatever we do in our households, it all ends up in wastewater. Oh, if they interfere, uh, p potentially in terms of the the because that's surfactants might be might be interfering with uh, with some of the chemicals. But again, we have processes to deal with this. But yeah, one thing is they interfere. The other thing, they're actually interesting things to look at in the first place. So, as I said, sky's the limit in terms of what we can find in wastewater. Um, and yes, it's just a matter of time and resource to, to, to find it, I guess. I have a question. It <laughs> <laughs> sort of occurred to me as you were talking. Um, I, I, I wonder if anyone's used a, a, a similar approach to, to none of what wild, wildlife diseases. Obviously, wildlife don't go to the toilet. But I was thinking specifically of avian flu, for example. Mm. So if you could use this sort of approach in, in reservoirs or where there's a lot of uh, waterfowl. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a good way forward. And actually in the context of One Health, yeah. so we need to be kind of expanding from the kind of wastewater in the wider environment so we get a full understanding of what's happening. Yeah. And uh, uh, I guess with pathogens and the kind of the human versus animal we need to understand better am i right so yeah, so yeah, yeah that's something that yeah. you might want to no, investigate yeah talk to you. it's your next project <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>